Today we are going to be talking about depression and we are going to talk about King David, a man in the Bible who spent lots and lots of time feeling depressed in his life. A lot of it because of just life itself, because of sin, because of the people in his life that hurt him. And a lot of it stemmed from just feeling God just really wasn't there. So join us today as we work through our lesson, Why Am I Depressed? All right, good morning. Welcome to those of you that are watching us apparently online because that's about the only way you can watch us right now. Uh, first, we miss you. For those of you that normally come to Bible study, uh, as you know, because of COVID, we aren't allowed to have a, a group of people here. So it's literally like I keep saying, me and David <laughs> are camera guys. So um, we, we miss you. The room is empty. It feels very, very awkward. So um, just so you know that. Uh, first, if you don't know anything about our ministry and you're joining us online for the first time, uh, you can go up here to womensbiblestudy.com. Uh, there you can get handouts for today's lesson. You can watch us lots of different ways. Our whole goal for this ministry is to have you be able to watch Bible study anytime, anywhere. So you can watch us on YouTube, uh, a Roku channel, a Roku TV. You can watch us, um, how else, a app. You can download our Women's Bible Study app. Uh, we're now podcasting through iTunes and Spotify, so lots and lots of different ways that you can watch us along with online at womensbiblestudy.com. All right, uh, because we're still videotaping here, it's kind of fun because even though COVID's here and, and we can't meet as a group, Rob asked me the other day, he said, um, it's so cool that you kind of haven't even missed a beat. Like our whole goal was to start August 19th which is exactly what we did. So we've been able to, to keep this series going, even though no one's really here. So Rob asked me the other day, he said, how do you like teaching to an empty room? <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's kind of hard. And he goes, what's the hardest part? And I said, well, the hardest part, of course, is because I tell a joke and nobody laughs. So this is what Rob bought me. Here you go. So now we have this. I have a laugh track now. <laughs> so whenever I tell a joke... I, I get to do this and then I'll make, it may sound stupid to you, but it makes me feel much better up here. So anyway, we got that going on. All right. Another thing I need to tell you really quick too is the room where we have the Bible study, uh, it's either really hot or really cold. And since no one's here actually in the building, they've kind of kept the air really hot. So if you're wondering like why my hair is blowing up here, <laughs> it's not because we're trying to do that whole like movie thing like you know where her her you know hair is blowing in the wind and that effect we're not trying to do that that's just me trying to like not die of heat up here because <laughs> the lights are really really hot so just so you know that if you see my hair blowing that just means that I'm hot for the minute that I'm going to go stand in front of the fan so there you go all right let's start here I have to show you first my my cute picture of my two grandsons their first day of school which actually meant uh their first day at home uh, at, for, for, since they can't go to school, but they, their mom took their, their pictures and it was the cutest thing ever. So I have to show this to you. So they had to write on the bottom, like, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? So my grandson on the right, Titus, he decides he wants to be a, um, a, a police. That's what he wrote on his. Zeke <laughs> is our funny little grandson. He's just so, he's so adorable. But he, he on the left wrote something and it looked like he wants to be a dolphin. <laughs> So I called Shayla and I said, honey, what does Zeke want to be? Like, it looks like he wants to be a dolphin. And she said, nope, he wants to be a donut man. <laughs> because he thinks that, like, if he could just make the donuts, then that way then he could eat them too. And that would, that would be the perfect job for him. So I'm like, oh, to be a kid again, wouldn't that be awesome? All right, let's start here. I can use my new laugh button. Let's, um, we're going to talk today about depression again, but we're going a different way on that. So... There was a psychology instructor, and he finished this lecture on, on mental health, and he was giving this verbal quiz to, to his students. So he asked this, he said, how would you diagnose a patient who walks back and forth, screaming at the top of his lungs one minute, and then sits in a chair weeping uncontrollably the next? 
a young man in the rear raised his hand and answered, a basketball coach? <laughs> there you go. That does kind of help. <laughs> All right. We laugh, but really, honestly, mental health and depression is a very, very serious issue. So that's why we decided to do this whole series called Been There, Done That, because we wanted to learn from the men and women of the Bible who have actually been depressed and have done the whole, how do I get past my depression thing? And last week, we talked about depression also, but we, we talked about Elijah, and we kind of went a whole different way with that. Uh, we talked about how do you get past depression when you feel like, you know, when you had this huge victory in your life. But today I want to go a different way, and I want to talk about King David, because he had a lot of times that he was very, very depressed. And all you have to do is read Psalms, where he wrote most of his, his life out, and, and a lot of it was just very, very down, very depressed kind of a state for him. Now, I want to talk today about how he overcame it, because remember, back then they didn't have like doctors and psychologists, and he just, he just had to go to God. Now, I want to preface that by saying that, first of all, I'm not a doctor, not trying to give you any kind of medical advice. I talked to you last week that a lot of our children have OCD, so therefore we have a lot of kids that are on medicine, so I'm all for medicine if you need it. So please don't don't hear me say anything other than that. But I'm hoping that somehow today we can get maybe some biblical insights that might help you if, you know, if you don't feel like you need to see a doctor, but you just kind of feel really, really sad in life. So today we're going to work through some of the Psalms and, um, and learn from David. So that's where we're going to go with this. Let's start here. Jessica Brody said this, depression is like being in a hole you can't climb out of or a net that won't let you go free. Crying doesn't help and neither does rage. You've prayed with all your might, yet it's, it's still there. For those who don't have it, depression can be hard to understand. A mood disorder with both mental and physical impacts. Depression is is different from typical feelings of sadness or grief. Some people describe it as feelings like a series of weights have been placed upon their shoulders, dragging them lower and lower until they can barely crawl. Others say it's a persistent invading melancholy that won't go away, no matter how good life seems to be. Still others feel numb, lethargic, like they're running on battery, but slowly, methodically winding down to a bare hum of energy. So the question we want to ask today is this. What could be causing my depression, and what can I do spiritually? See, depression, I think, for a lot of us, we've all suffered from it probably in our life to some degree, and and some people more than others. I know for me, I did, I suffered... a a very depressed time in my life. Uh, But I think God did that just to remind me how it really does feel to to feel that low, low, low. And and I'll I'll explain to you um, what helped me get out of that. But I want to learn today from the people who got their help from God. And what we need to know about depression is this. Someone wrote that depression is so common that it's called the common cold of mental illness. But what's encouraging is this, is that we see depression in the Bible. We see it from men and women, and and that's why we're doing this series, Been There, Done That, because we want you to know that that people have been there, and we want to learn from them how to get out of it. So let's start with King David. Let's learn a little bit about him. First, King David was a shepherd when he was a young boy. Uh, He was the youngest in his family. He had this really, really amazing heart for God at a very, very young age. Um, one day he's watching his sheep like he normally does, and his brothers come running out and say, hey, the prophet Samuel is at the house and he wants to meet you. Now, that's a really big deal at that particular time. So he goes to the house, uh, prophet Samuel is looking to anoint the next king, and he sees Dan, uh, uh, David and says, it's you. So he anoints him to be king. Now, now this time, David's like a teenager, and he's like, I, I can't be king. We already have a king. Saul is the king. But David just went back to tending sheep because he didn't really know what to do. So eventually, his brothers were fighting the Philistines. So his dad said, hey, David, I want you to take, you know, your brother some food. So David goes down onto the front lines, and there he sees this giant of a man that we know as Goliath, and he's taunting David's God. 
and he's taunting the God of Israel. And David's just like, what is wrong with you people? Like you should be, we, we have this awesome God. You should be running towards the giant and not away from him. And so David picks up some stones and puts it in a slingshot and kills Goliath. And from then on, he begins this long trek to become king. But King Saul, his reign wasn't going to last much longer because he just refused to obey God. 1 Samuel 13, 14 says this, But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. That's David, a man after God's own heart. And if that's true, then you would kind of expect David to be perfect. Like you would kind of expect David to to just always do things right, because that's what men after God's own heart should do, right? But he really didn't. He has an affair with Bathsheba. He, He kills off Bathsheba's husband. He lived in Philistine territory. He works for a Philistine king and then, and then lies to him every single day he's working for him. He, he actually didn't even trust God very much of the time. He was all angry with God a lot. He was confused a lot. He was not even a really good father at all. But I want to point that out because I think that's a starting point to jump off on why a lot of times Christians feel depressed. And I think a lot of Christians feel depressed because they're not perfect, they still sin, and here it is, we feel God could not possibly be happy with us. And I think it's this reminder to all of us today that we are all a work in process, that David wasn't perfect, and neither are we. But think about everything that David did that wasn't right, and yet what did God do? God didn't just wipe him off the face of the earth. Instead, he just, he corrected him. He got him back on track. And see, for us, David is this poster child for this whole idea of of depression and sin. Now, here's what we're going to learn from David. Depression is not a sin, but sin can lead to depression. Always know that. Some people go, oh, well, you're living in sin because you're depressed. Well, that's not true. If you get a cold or the flu or you have back pain or something like that, does anyone ever tell you that you're being sinful because you have those things? And, and the answer is no, that's pretty unreasonable. And it's the same with, with depression. It's unreasonable to say that depression is a sin or any other kind of mental illness for that matter. But we always have to go back to that God created this world to be perfect, And then sin entered it and then threw this whole world into chaos where there's sickness and death and all these these horrible tragedies that happen. And that's just part of living in a fallen world. And depression is actually a part of that. Illness, whether it be physical or mental, is one of the many ways we see how broken our world is. So always know that, that depression is not sin. But a lot of times we get depressed, and this is why, because we're living in sin. When we go out and get drunk, again. When we go sleep with that guy, again. When we watch the porn, again. When we scream and yell, again. See, people become depressed when they sin and can't stop. So I think the question that we want to ask ourselves is this. If you know that what you're doing is not right, then here's our question. Do you want to let God change you? I was talking to someone the other day, and, and they said, yeah, my child got in trouble. And, and so the dad went up to, to her and said, do you feel bad for what you did? And she's like, no, not at all. I feel absolutely no remorse whatsoever. But see, what separated David from everyone else is that he actually did feel bad. He had this heart to want to do what God asked him to do. He knew he wasn't perfect, but deep down, he wanted God to change him. I have a really, really funny joke, which I I don't think I've ever told it here, but I might have. I don't remember. But I told it to every person that I I talked to before this, and they laughed hysterically, so I think you'll find it funny. But once upon a time, there was a beautiful, independent, self-assured princess, and she happened to see a frog in a pond. So the frog said to the princess, I was once a very, very handsome prince until an evil witch put a spell on me. But one kiss from you and I will turn back into a prince where you can marry me. You can move into the castle with my mom. You can prepare my meals and clean my clothes and bear my children and forever feel happy doing this. That night while the the princess dined on frog legs, (laughs) 
She laughed and said, yeah, I don't think so. Oh, I can't get my laugh machine to at work. Oh, for the love. Well, anyway, that was kind of cute. Um, okay, well, that didn't work. So hopefully you're laughing. I thought that was just so funny, like she's dining on frog legs. <laughs> All right. We see David's heart to change in this. Psalms 139, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So let's first see how, how David handled his depression that came from his sin. Psalm 38 verse 1 says this, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me and your hand has come down on me. See, sometimes when we're living in sin and we know we're doing something that we're not supposed to be doing, we feel what David felt, this heavy, heavy hand of God on us. And, and for David and for you and for me, depression can actually be the outcome of that when you just constantly feel the heavy hand of God. Verse 3, there is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden or too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. See, David knows what he's doing is just not right. I'm utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I'm exhausted, completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. Now when I read that, it just I see all those words, heaviness, burden, anguish, crushed. And I think it sounds a lot like people when they become depressed. And a lot of it comes from our sin. Always remember, if you feel this way, it's not because God's mad at you. It's because he's using this heaviness to help you move away from your sin. That's the goal. When you feel God's heavy hand on you, it's like he's trying to say, look, I have something so much better for you. But I love what David does when he feels crushed. He, he does what we should all do, which is this. He cries out to the Lord. Verse 9, O oh Lord. All my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. Isn't that amazing? When I felt depressed, all I could do was sigh. Nothing, everything just, I just sighed all the time. I just felt so sad all the time. And, and that's what, what part of depression is. He says, my heart throbs, my strength fails me. The light of my eyes, it is also gone from me. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. If we're depressed because of our own personal sin, God's saying, look, my hand is going to be heavy on you, and I really, really need you to move away from that. And let's move on from this, because I've got something so much better for you. I want to read a letter that someone wrote to John MacArthur, and, and this kind of says it all. She writes this. I'm a 27-year-old female. When I was 14, I began to experience depression frequently. I was not a Christian, nor was I raised by Christian parents. My depression continued as I grew older, and as a result, became worse as time passed. I became a chronic suicide case. When I was 20, I went to a psychiatrist who diagnosed me as manic depressive. He put me on lithium and told me I that I would be this way for the rest of my life. The drug therapy kept me from going into severe suicidal depression. However, the deep feelings of depression and despair were still a reality. I finally came to a low where there was nowhere to turn but to the Lord. I heard the Christian life was supposed to be the only way to live, but God was not real to me. I decided I was going to seek God with my whole heart. Then, if I found this to be nothing but an empty endeavor, I would give up living. I fed upon tapes of your Bible teaching, which was John MacArthur. The Lord began his work in me. Through his word as you taught, the Holy Spirit showed me just exactly what my problem was and what I needed to do about it. My problem was sin a heart that would not forgive, and it was making me bitter. I turned to the Lord and asked him to help me forgive. I continued in the word diligently, and the transformation process took place. The Lord delivered me from this depressive illness. The memorizing of scripture is renewing my mind. This is the only key for anyone suffering emotional problems because it is the living word of God. It's the supernatural power to transform anyone's life and mind. Now, what I loved about that is that sometimes we forget that. We forget that there's power in the Word of God. And, and the power with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, that's what changes us on the inside. But for us, we need to spend the time reading and studying. We can't just like pick up a devotional you know, and read one verse a day and then just think like, 
you're going to be healed. It, it doesn't really work that way. So I brought this because I always I was super excited the day I found my little Aunt Jemima uh, jar here. But it was just this reminder of this, that if this is the Word of God, oh, let's see if I can do this without like dumping it all over everything. Here you go. If we're putting, let's say, a just a, a devotional, you know, maybe once a week or something like that, this is what your life's going to look like. Like it's like there's not... There's not much anything spiritual there. And so we're going, well, why can't I feel close to God? Why don't I, what's my problem? And the problem is, is that we're not pouring the word of God into our life to change us. So we may be this much changed. But that's what I'm saying. The more you do this, if you spend time in the word every single day, and you pour and you pray and you ask God to change you, then what happens is he starts filling up your life. And the more you do that, the more you're going to look like this. And your life is going to look, you're going to be able to handle things spiritually because there's more spiritual stuff going on than there is non-spiritual stuff. So that's why it's really, really important to do that. Now, I'll tell you a little about me. I, I think I'm kind of a brat, just so you know that. There are things in my life that I think about that I know I shouldn't think. There's things that I do that I know isn't right. And sometimes that makes me depressed. And I think it's because I really honestly in my heart, I don't want to think those things and I don't want to act like that. But I also don't let depression take over because of that. Because I know one thing. I know this. I can't change me, but God can. The Spirit of God can change who I am. So when I'm doing something stupid or saying something stupid that I know I shouldn't, then what I do is I just stop and say, God, I know, I know everything I'm thinking, saying, doing is wrong. So I need you to change me. I really, really want you to change me. And see, I think that's the beginning of actually getting better. It's that time where you say, God, I really, I, I don't want to be this way anymore. And somehow when we acknowledge that to God, then he can start working those things out in our life. Now, let's talk about the next thing that, that depressed David, which I think depresses a lot of us. And it's this, when life just feels overwhelming. We see this in Psalm 142, a psalm of David regarding his experience in the cave of prayer. Now, imagine this. David's running for his life. King Saul usually has thousands of men, and they're running through the forest or the, the, the wilderness and, and the mountains, and, and they're trying to find David to kill him. Like, you're constantly just terrified for this. And it's like he can't seem to get away from this. Every time he thinks that he's fine with Saul, then Saul does something else stupid to try to kill him. Like David's in constant turmoil. He's constantly in fear. He's trying to take care of the 400 men that have stood by his side. That's a lot of stuff going on in his life. But look what he says in verse 1. I cry out to the Lord. See, it's just this theme that we keep saying. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. See, that's what we need to learn to do. Talk to God. Pour out your feelings. Pour out your troubles. Have a relationship with him where you can do that. Because David does this by, here you go, crying out to God. That's like, that's like David's go-to thing whenever life gets bad. It's not like, I'm going to go see the doctor. It's, I am going to cry out to the Lord. I'm going to get on my knees and say, God, I need you to do something in my life. Look at what verse 3 says. When I'm overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. See, David's like, when I'm overwhelmed, see, you and I can just put our names in there. When I feel overwhelmed, we all do, especially in this life right now. But God, I'm, I'm trusting you know where I should go. I want to read a story from Dylan Dawson. He's from New City Church in Raleigh. And it's so interesting. This is what he learned from depression. He said, about a year ago, I heard a prominent Christian leader whom I respect explain his thoughts on depression. He said he did not believe true believers in Christ could really be depressed because our hope is ultimately in Christ. He talked about how Christians understand that this life can be difficult, but in the end, we know that Christ will not give us more than we can handle, and that we know in the end that Christ will prevail. Therefore, no committed Christian should suffer from depression because we know there is more to life than our present circumstances. It did not make sense to him that a Christian should be, could be depressed, but here's what he said. He was wrong. 
And I kind of agree. He was wrong. <laughs> he says, now for those familiar with my story, you know that I lost my father to suicide in 2009. 2009 was a horrible year in my life. Five people I knew died in 2009. Obviously, none were as difficult to deal with as my father's death. In the fall, I headed back to UNC Wilmington for my sophomore year, hoping this would help me heal and move forward. Unfortunately, it didn't. Many other things went wrong when school started back up. I got to the point where I feared each day, wondering what bad thing would happen next. I was not happy. I was internally bitter at every single person who seemed happy. And I thought I would never feel anywhere close to normal again. He said, I was depressed. I thought I hit it well, but then people I barely even knew began asking me if anything was wrong. I must have been asked that at least twice a week by various people for about two months. I still, I still am not sure how most of these people could tell I was different. They barely even knew me. I knew many people were praying for me and my family. I was surprised by the people who knew what I was dealing with and truly cared. I was also surprised by some who I thought would care more but hardly did anything. But how does this prove that this prominent Christian leader was wrong in his views on depression? Because I have never been closer to Jesus in my life than I was for those three months that I was depressed. He said, I read the entire Bible through in about 70 days. I prayed more often and for longer amounts of time. I would be so upset that I would hand write chapters of the Bible on notebook paper. I read the entire biblical books of Isaiah and Jeremiah in one day. That was 118 pages of the Bible in one day. Bible pages have small print and two columns per page. That's a lot of reading. And I was depressed. Never once did I question God's goodness in all I went through that year. I never questioned why this happened to me or or even if God existed. The only thing I did question was the power of prayer. And through it all, I knew that God was still God and that God was still good. I knew that Jesus was still greater than what I was going through and that he can bring good out of any situation. I knew all of that. I know God cared. I knew God loved me. I knew God was in control, but I couldn't help it. I was still depressed. By the end of the year, I began to come out of it by the grace of God. I was still a long way away from feeling any kind of normal again, but I was slowly getting better. If you are a follower of Christ and for whatever reason have fallen into depression, trust me, he said, it will get better. I like the following quote that says this, it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. He says, pain and grief were emotions created by God. You should not feel guilty for feeling them. Being depressed does not mean you no longer love Jesus or that Jesus no longer loves you. If you need help, get help. Do not stay stuck. And to the prominent Christian leader and no doubt others who believe that firm believers in Christ should never be depressed, you're wrong. I've been there. I did not choose it. And I did all I could do to get out of it. But for a while, there was nothing I could do to change it. So yes, Christians can suffer from depression. And the words of David Crowder, who wrote a song I listened to over and over in my depression. In joy and pain, in sun and rain, you're the same. Oh, you never let go. You never let go. Here's what I think. Use your depression to pour yourself into God. I love what he said. Like a lot of times people get depressed and it pushes them farther away from God. And I'm like, no, what if you flipped that around and did what he did? You poured your life into the Bible and you kept reading and you kept focusing on God and praying and listening to worship music and all of those kind of things. Because your depression may last some months, but I think at the end you'll find you're stronger to, you're closer to God and probably stronger. The next reason we get depressed is, there you go, people! People make us depressed. I always say, people, people, people. People, they, they gossip about us. They hurt us. They backstab us. They steal from us. Look at Psalm 142.3. David goes, wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. And see, when we really get that, we, we, we get to the point of going, I just, I'm so depressed because of people. I don't know what to do. Like, they run my life. But I think the hope for today is that we get to the point of going, you know what? I don't care what people say or think about me. I'm not going to let people control how I feel. It's amazing how not easy that is. 
because we we do this and we have a YouTube channel and we have people can email me or Facebook me or whatever, I get a lot of messages and a lot of them for the most part are very nice and encouraging and, and thank you for your ministry and I learned this and blah, blah, blah. And those always make me really happy. But then there are those <laughs> that, that, that I, they're, they're Christians, I'm assuming, because they're watching these programs, but they can write the meanest, ugliest thing. And it's not even what I'm teaching. It's me personally. <laughs> and I'm like, what is wrong with you? But what's amazing is that if I had 10 good messages and one bad message, I will always focus on the one bad. And I think that's just human nature. That's just what happens. But I came to the realization one day that it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people say. And I, and I wanted to get to this point where I pray like what David prayed in verse 5. Then I pray to you, O Lord, and I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. See, think about that. God, it really only matters what you think. And I think that's how, when you can flip that switch, I think it's, it's life-changing. And I think you can move from being depressed about people and start going, you know what, how sad for that person who wrote that. How sad for that person who lied about me. How sad, like, what is wrong in their life that they are so, they're so awful and mean? And then we can flip that and start praying for them. Chris posted this on Facebook. I stole the saying and wrote it down here. If their name is not God, then their opinion doesn't matter, and their approval is not needed. I think that's something we should put on our refrigerators and always remember that. He goes on to say this in verse 6. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. But then look who helps him, verse 7. Bring me out of this prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. See, usually when you and I feel depressed, we're like, I just don't really want to see anyone. But here's David in a cave with all the, the, the men in his area that are kind of all misfits, but they're standing by him. And suddenly he realizes how good God is, that he's, he's brought these men into his life. And you know what? Here's our, our, what we learned from that, is that when you feel depressed, you need godly, non-judgmental people to come around you. People who will say, you know what? I, I get that you're feeling that way. I'm so sorry that you're feeling that way. But that also have the courage to say, you cannot stay in this place. And then they, they help you get out of bed and, and try to get back into life. Let's move on to the next psalm. David starts out doing what he does in all of his psalms, which is kind of a lesson in its own for today, is crying out to God. Like that's kind of a theme where anything that happens in our life, we just cry out to God. We don't cry out to our friends or our neighbors or our spouse. We just, we literally go to God and cry out to him. It always starts there. Psalm 143 says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my plea. Answer me because you're faithful and righteous. Don't put your servant on trial, for no one is innocent before you. My enemy has chased me. He has knocked me to the ground and forced me to live in darkness like those in the grave. I'm losing all hope, and I'm paralyzed with fear. And I think depression has that component. Depression makes us fearful that life will never be the same. I changed this, and I'm not exactly sure what I said um, on that. There's a loss of hope that I'm not sure how it's worded up on the screen, but there is this loss of hope that we might never get better. I think there's, there's a fear that I'm, I'm not going to ever get out of this depression. I, I'm always going to be afraid of that. But David goes on after he's just said that he's fearful and he's paralyzed and he's losing hope. And you know what David does? Look at this word. Remember. David remembered. Verse 5 says this, I remember the days of old. David looks back like, I remember. I ponder all your great works and think about what you've done. Like when I get fearful, when I, get, when I feel hopeless, I'm like, wait a minute. I need to focus on this awesome, mighty God instead of focusing on our little problems. I want to read this together with you because I thought this was so cool. In the world of science, there's no more prestigious institution than Cambridge's University's Cavendish Laboratory. 
It's home to more than two centuries of Nobel Prize winning research, including the discovery of the structure of DNA. Listen to this. Inscribed over its entrance are the words, the works of the Lord are great, sought out by all of them that have pleasure therein. Psalms 111 verse 2. That's in the King James Version. So I went through and I found other versions of it. Look at the New Living Translation. How amazing are the deeds of the Lord. All who delight in him should ponder them. We should constantly be thinking about it. The New King James Version. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. NIV. Great are the works of the Lord. They're pondered by all who delight in them. This goes on to say the verse in Latin was carved in oak over the original entrance when the laboratory was established in 1874 by Cavendish Professor of Physics James Clerk Maxwell, 1831 to 1879. Maxwell was known for numerous achievements in mathematical physics, uh, including formulating the classical theory of electromagnetic radiation. I don't get any of that, okay, just so you know that. But he was also a very committed follower of Jesus. When, in, when the laboratory moved to its present site 100 years later, the inaugural verse again received star billing, now in English. Imagine this, this, this above this door is a, a verse all about the works of God, that anything that happens in this laboratory, like it's all of God. Like that's, that was just like so cool to me. If we're shocked at eminent scientists citing scripture as the grounds and inspiration of their work, because here you go, We've lost sight of how important biblical ideas were to the foundation of uh, Western intellectual life. We, we, didn't, we forgot that. Like we, Now science is such this thing that's like we're trying to disprove God. Back then, they were like, no, no, no. God is the one who has given all this to us and given us the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to figure this out, but, but it's all about him. Like That's just great, great news. Prominent early scientist Johannes Kepler described his work as a scientist as this, thinking God's thoughts after him. Like God's already thought about all this stuff. He's just given it so that we can think about it afterwards. See, I think a lot of times we go into depression and we feel hopeless and we feel like our life is never going to get better because we just forget about God and his, here you go, we forget his amazing works. Like, we forget his blessings, we forget he saved us, we forget his creation, his power. And a lot of times we get depressed because we forget who he is, why he has created us, and what our purpose is. And when you and I forget this awesome God and forget that he created us and that he has a plan for our life and he has a purpose for us, I think we can fall into depression. Like this man who forgot something. I gotta get my laugh machine to work, because that just doesn't work if I can't, if I can't make it laugh, too. A widow <laughs> complained to her friend. She goes, my husband forgot to take out life insurance. Her friend says, well, it's not like he left you in the poorhouse. I mean, where did you get that new diamond ring? The widow answered, well, he left me $1,000 for a casket and 5000 for a stone. <laughs> this is the stone. <laughs> Do you like my new laugh machine? It's kind of cute, huh? You're hating it. <laughs> David's just looking at me like, I could just see him. I could just see him rolling his eyes at me right now. <laughs> All right, we have to remember this. Deuteronomy 4 9. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Deuteronomy 8 10 says this When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. See, the Israelites forgot God. After everything he did for them, and think about that, in the United States, I think we have that same problem. It's easy for us to forget what God has done. But here you go. Forgetting doesn't take special effort. It just happens. It's our gravitational pull. If we don't attend to God's words and works, we lose our delight in them. We lose our way. We lose perspective. We forget who we are and whose we are. 
See, we can get really, really depressed if we forget that God loves us and has a plan for our lives. So if you're feeling depressed, try to remember who God is and what he has in store for us during the short time we have on this earth. We have a very, very short time on this earth. And I always say, please, please, we do not want depression to, to ruin that. Like the short time that we have, we want to be joyful and, and being able to get out there and tell people about Jesus because we have really, really good news. The next thing David says is this, verse 6, I lift my hands to you in prayer. I thirst for you as parched land thirsts for rain. Pray, desire God. Lift our hands in prayer. But I love this. I love the way that David talks about this. I thirst for you as parched land thirst for rain. So here's our picture of parched land. And imagine that no water, dry, cracked. And I think when you have depression, I think you feel that way. I think you just kind of feel like, I just feel dry. I feel spiritually empty. I feel spiritually parched. But David continues and says this. Come quickly, Lord, and answer me, for my depression deepens. Don't turn away from me, or I will die. David just reminds us that he feels depressed. He's been there. This is a man after God's own heart. But sometimes when we feel down, I think we have to get to this point. We need to understand sometimes that our deepest need must be for the Lord himself. Not to feel better. Not for your boyfriend or your husband or your children or your grandchildren or your job or your hobbies. Like, we need to understand that our deepest need must be for God himself. And sometimes I think that's why we always say, pick up your Bible first thing in the morning. Read through Psalms. Read through everything that David's gone through. And I think you'll get a better understanding of, of what it means to just want the Lord himself most off, most, most over everything. Then David says this, verse 10, teach me to do your will, for you're my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. See, when we're depressed, we feel like we have no footing whatsoever. Nothing spiritual is holding us. Nothing, God's not holding nothing. We just feel like we're losing it. I've used this book a lot because this is the book that helped me when I needed to get out of my depression. Uh, Brian Jones wrote this book. It's called Second Guessing God. I always say if you want a really good book, this is one of the staples that I keep in in my office because I think probably because um, it just helped me so much. I want to read this section here that helped me through it, but also it's something that helped him. He says this, the year before I graduated from seminary, I lost my faith. There's not a big job market out there for pastors who are atheists, but I couldn't help it. Life became too painful. One night in a last-ditch effort to salvage whatever remnant of faith I had left, I called a mentor and professor of mine from college and shared my struggle with him. I told him my faith in God right now is like a walk on the beach. I've taken off my shoes, and as I stand at the water's edge, the tide has started to roll across my feet. It feels wonderful. Up to this point, my spiritual journey has been incredible. But in the last six months, doubt has begun to paralyze me. It's like when the water goes back to the ocean. It is washing away the sand underneath me, and and my feet keep sinking lower and lower and lower. If this keeps up, there won't be anything left to stand on. His mentor sent back to him, said back to him, and said this, Brian, I have stood where you're standing. I have felt the water cascade across my feet. I know how wonderful that feels, but I've also had the water go back out to sea. I have felt the sand get washed away from, my, from underneath my feet. Brian, listen to me when I say this. When the last grain of sand is finally gone, you're going to discover that you're standing on a rock. He said that one sentence saved me. That one sentence gave me enough spiritual strength to eventually, over time, rediscover hope, which the Bible calls an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. See, if you're struggling with depression, you need to know that many people in the Bible struggled with it. Pastors like Brian Jones, teachers, Bible, whoever, they really honestly have been there and done that. But I was thinking about, what what is it that, that... most people, the, the root, I would say, of what people feel depressed about. And I think it's this. 
I think we feel God has forgotten us. I thought this was cute. A man who just turned 100, he was being interviewed by a local newspaper. The reporter asked him, do you remember the first girl you ever kissed? And the old man thought for a minute and he says, young man, I can't even remember the last girl I ever kissed. <laughs> Verse 13, or Psalm 13, how long, O oh Lord? Forgetting is just kind of a thing. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? See, even David felt this way. God, why do I feel like you've forgotten me? And I think that's where a lot of our depression comes from because we just think God isn't there and he just doesn't care. Um, how long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and my sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Why am I so discouraged? Why am I so sad? See, I'm hoping that you get this picture that this is, this is from, from someone who's been there and done that. They get this. They get this whole depression thing. But what we always see from David is this, we have to turn our focus back to God. The psalmist responds like this, I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Jim Wallace says this, hope is not a feeling, it's a decision. And the decision for hope is based upon what you believe at the deepest levels, what your most basic convictions are about the world and what the future holds, all based upon your faith. You choose hope, not as a naive wish, but as a choice with your eyes wide open to the reality of the world. See, sometimes we forget that we really do have hope. Pastor Todd Peppercorn shares the following, overcoming depression is not just a matter of cheer up or just have more faith and joy or some pious version of get over it. He said, I knew the gospel. I knew all the right answers. I had it all figured out and preached it Sunday after Sunday. But our Lord in his mercy chose to crush me to cause me to suffer with him so that the faith he gave me would be stronger, clearer, and more focused. But traveling down that dark road, I have come to understand what the light of Christ is all about. As Christ's followers, we're called to reflect the light. We're called to remind one another as the Psalms constantly reassure us that those who know and love God also struggle through seasons of despair. We need to really understand that. All of our life, there are going to be times when you and I struggle through seasons of despair. He goes on to say, David was a man after God's own heart with a faith so vast it steeled him against a giant. Yet in the Psalms, he laments. Seasons find him in agony, crying out to the Lord whom he cherishes, but who he fears has fallen silent. In their deep longing and poetic Im imagery, the Psalms gives a voice to our own suffering. They reveal that even those rich in faith are prone to despondency. I'm hoping today encourages you because you need to know that you're not alone. Like people have all gone through the same thing, but it, it really matters what you do with it. Here's what you need to know that what you have that maybe someone who's not a Christian has, and that's hope. Hope that God is doing something in your life. Hope that when you get through this, that you will know God more, that you will have grown stronger in your faith, and at the other end, you will be able to come along somebody else who is dealing with depression and help them through it. As Christians, we have hope that's beyond this life. Because here's the, the great news, I guess is that even if your depression never goes away on this earth, in this life, we have an eternity that's waiting for us, promised to us, where there will be no tears, no pain, no depression. And as weird as it sounds, as a follower of Jesus, we actually don't even look at the world the same as someone who doesn't know Jesus. We don't look at pain and depression and death the same. Because we know, you know well, this is just an earthly tent we're living in. It's, it's not permanent. And we have a hope that someday we're going to have a new body. One without any signs of any kind of mental illness or, or depression. And it's all because Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose from the grave. And when he came back, it just shows us that there is an afterlife. Because people don't just die, and then three days later, they just come back to life. It doesn't work that way. 
So, so Jesus' death and resurrection reminds us that there really is an eternity waiting for us. And if you are, are watching and you don't, you don't know that you're going to this awesome eternity, it's all about Jesus. It's all about giving your life to him. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Give your life to him because there is an afterlife and there's one of two different places that you'll go to and we want your eternity to be secure in heaven. My son was watching an interview with some people about this whole coronavirus and, and the person interviewing them said there was such a difference between the people who believed that there would be an afterlife, that they, would, that they would go to heaven versus the people who didn't believe that at all, like if you were an atheist or agnostic. He said he was shocked at how the Christians were handling the virus so different than the people who weren't Christians. And I think it all comes down to because we know that like, we're not living for the things of this world. And I know for myself, if... If, and I probably for most of the Christians that if we got the coronavirus, you know what, and died, I don't know. Okay, well, to live is Christ, to die is gain. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, as a non-believer, all they have is today, which is why there's so much fear out there in the world because they're so panic-stricken of death. If I can't get the coronavirus because then I might die. See, as a Christian, when you die, that's when things get really good. So that's why as a Christian, we're going to answer these, you know, how we feel about the coronavirus and respond to it a little bit differently. Verse 5 said this, I will put my hope in God and I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. It's like a, a, a mom, she was 91 years of age. She had to enter the hospital because of poor health. Attempting to comfort her, her, her son said, now mom, don't worry, you'll be home in a few days. And she smiled and she said, oh, I know that. I, I just don't know which home I'm going to go to. But there was comfort in that. I can go back to my earthly home or I can go to my heavenly home. It, like, it doesn't really matter. So what's the answer for the lesson today? Verse 8 says this, but each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night, now think about that, through each night, I sing his songs praying to God who gives me life. And the answer is, it looks like for depression to me is this. You just got to focus on God. We have to stop focusing on the people who make us depressed. We have to stop focusing on our sin that makes us depressed. We have to stop focusing on life that feels depressing. We have to stop focusing on fear and loss of hope. It says in that verse, through the night. What is night? Night is darkness. Through the darkness, do things, worship music, read your Bible, I mean, constantly be thinking and praying to God, focusing on what God is doing in this world. Just like the girl who listened to John MacArthur sermons every day, she kept the Bible in front of her. She learned new things. See, our minds have to become so transformed that we love God more than we love this world. And I think that's the one thing I've learned in 2020 since the whole coronavirus it's like I, I realize how little everything going on in the world even affects me because I see a bigger picture. We've studied Revelation. <laughs> okay, I know how this whole thing's, where, how it's going to go and where we're going with that. But it's like I, the world sees this coronavirus and death and, and all this horrible stuff. And I look at it like, I don't know, God's doing something. I don't know what, but I really honestly trust that he knows what he's doing. And, and I don't have any fear. Because I know this. God has numbered my days. He has given me a number of days to live, and he chooses to take me home from the coronavirus, then he does. And that's okay. But I think for me, I want him to use me while I'm here. I don't want to spend one more minute being depressed because there's too much for us to do in the short amount of time. Here's what I want to say. I'm hoping that if you feel depressed today, that you can start saying over and over and over, just like David did, Oh God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? 
Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed from my enemies? Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? And then you flip that around and you say, but you know what, God? I will put my hope in you. And I will praise you again, my Savior and my God. Hopefully that helps you today. We will see you next week with a new lesson of someone else who has been there, done that. Have a really good week.